what's going on you guys i wanted to talk to you today about five problems i had with the last jedi now i've been a defender of this movie for a long time i actually really enjoyed it especially after the second viewing uh, i think it's a movie that deserves to be seen multiple times because i think you can pick up extra things each time but i'm not going to go so far as to say that this movie was perfect I have tried to make videos explaining certain things that people thought were plot holes. Uh, I tried to give my own take on certain things, and I think a lot of things can be explained uh, if you look deeper into it. And then maybe some things just don't need to be explained. That being said, here are five things that I think are problems with this movie. Granted, though, none of them take away from the movie experience, but the things that could have been improved upon or could have been done better, in my opinion. Number one, Canto Bite. Uh, the whole scene itself, I think, does kind of add something to at least where the story is going to go in the future, but how they got there was pretty much a contrivance as far as I'm concerned. You know, it, it's really not clear to me exactly why they called Maz Kanata. Like, we have to get through a First Order shield. Oh, okay, well, you know, let's just call Maz Kanata, who d isn't in the First Order, and, you know... It's just, it seems awfully contrived. Um, I know that Finn doesn't really know very many people since he's left the First Order. He's only been out for a few days and he was in a coma for most of that. But Poe should have known somebody else. And why didn't they inform, you know, Holdo or at least, you know, other people in command of what the plan was? The whole reason that they had to be a super secret mission that was unnecessary for me. Um, I don't know why they didn't tell hardly anybody. And, and, you know, the whole thing just kind of felt contrived. One, once they got there, there were some good things that happened. And I understand that, like, being there, for one, Star Wars movies tend to have multiple different landscapes and multiple different color schemes. And so you had the space stuff going on. Then you needed Canto Bite. And then you needed the red and white for the end battle on Crate. Uh, as well, you know, and I, mean, I guess you kind of had four different color schemes because you also had like the green of everything that was going on on Oct 2. So maybe it didn't even need to be there. Maybe you had three color schemes already. But, you know, it also showed you how the resistance was kind of spreading the message throughout the galaxy. So, you know, while they were there, good things happened. But the fact that they got there um, felt like a contrivance. Like, I don't think they needed to go there in the first place. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. That's one thing I think could have been done a little bit better, um, you know, instead of just jumping into calling Mas Kanata. Next thing, Phasma. Complete wasted opportunity here. I think Phasma could have been so much more and could have been done so much better. Um, really, really short screen time on this character. That was supposed to be a really big deal, and it's kind of getting the Boba Fett treatment. And I was, you know, granted, I understand there's, you can compare Phasma to Boba Fett in, the, in, in a lot of the same ways, uh, because, you know, a lot of hype, really cool costume, but very little actual doing stuff on screen. But the problem is that was a big complaint from the original trilogy. So rather than just mirror the original trilogy here, I think they could have taken it further and made it, you know, a more significant, profound character rather than just, you know, doing kind of using the same recipe. Uh, and there's other things about Phasma's character that just didn't make sense. And maybe some of this, um, you know, was extra scenes that had to get cut. Um, there was definitely at least one scene that felt like it was on the cutting room floor where as, after the big explosion happens and everybody gets knocked away, you know, kind of saving Finn and Rose and they just get everybody up knocked away. As Finn and Rose are getting up from this explosion, all of a sudden you see Phasma march in with all these First Order Stormtroopers. And I'm like, wait a second, shouldn't she be getting up off the ground? She, wasn't she, like, right next to them and they, everybody just got knocked down? Why is she, you know, 200 feet away now marching through the flames, like, you know, with all of the stormtroopers dressed right dress and lined up in formation? Doesn't make sense. That seems like it was a scene that was cut. Uh, like, maybe she, like, she gets up and runs away and scrambles her forces and, you know, tries to find a weapon or something like that, but it, it didn't make it into the movie, so it kind of left people like, wait, why is she over there? She was right next to him. But the, my other question about Phasma is, why is she on the Supremacy? Her ship is the finalizer. She should have been on the finalizer with General Huck. It doesn't make sense why she's on the Supremacy. Um, granted, it doesn't kill the movie for me that she's on there. It's just one of those head scratches. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. You know, is it, are they going to have to write another book about it explaining why she, well, she chose this time to go over to the supremacy because she figured Finn was coming, you know, like, like kind of weak point there. You know, I got to call it. I can't defend that one. She shouldn't have been there. Um, yeah. So on to number three, Leia in space. So Oh gosh, this was this this one is different because this one I don't know if it's a plot hole. I really don't think it's a plot hole, but it was it was hard and it's 
uh, problem isn't necessarily the best word, but it's the word I'm going with. And, and my problem isn't that Leia can use the Force. Uh, I think we've always kind of suspected that Leia was going to be, uh, you know, a Force user because she was, she's was she got that Skywalker blood. She could always kind of sense the Force. We see her kind of talk to Luke through the Force in, 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 in the original movie. So that's not really a surpriser. Well, the, the surprise here is like, when did she get training? Um, you know, we, we don't, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, like we didn't know that she was going to be as, as strong as she was. And actually, I, I kind of think that's cool. But the problem here is that, you know, Carrie Fisher's gone. And so we w- walked into this movie expecting, you know, that they were going to, they were going to honor Carrie Fisher in, in this beautiful way and kind of making her like, she looked like she was like this ice angel in space. Um, I, you know, watching this movie you know, for the first time thinking like, oh, this is, this is how she dies. She's, you know, she looks so peaceful out there. And as she's starting to freeze over, she looked kind of angelic. And then she came back to life. It really screwed with my emotions. And that was my problem there. And I'm like, we thought she was going to die in this movie. And then she didn't, but there was a scene where they could have, but they didn't. And that it's just really confusing. And emotionally, it's a problem for me. I'm not saying that we can't all get past this and that they are not going to do her right in the next movie. Uh, I'm sure she's, you know, she, they will have said that she gave her life rebuilding the rebellion and there'll be a statue or a ship in her honor or something like that. Um, but the way that this Ice Angel scene was done makes it very hard to watch. Uh, and, 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 from what I understand, this is, you know, this is stuff that was filmed and, and, and planned and part of the script long before, um, you know, Carrie died. So it's not like they, oh, well, she died. Let's purposely screw with the audience. No, this was already part of it. My problem is really going to be if they don't use that scene, um, because I'm told that they decided they had to keep this in because it was integral to the story. And from what I can see, it doesn't seem like it was integral to the story. They could have just had the explosion and had her been knocked out and had her in a coma. She didn't, there was no reason to have her go out into space, look dead, use the force to come back to life, fly through the air, you know, and it it could have just been an explosion. So, um, you know, if her force ability actually matters going into the future, like she teaches Ray a little bit and Ray learns some things from, from Leia before Leia dies in episode nine. And Ray like mentions that in episode nine, she's like, yes, I learned from both, you know, the brother and sister Skywalker or something like that. Then it makes sense because you needed to, you know, as long as they make it to where Leia's force ability is important for the overarching story, then I'm cool with it. But I've learned a little bit about having expectations of a Star Wars movie now. And so there's a big part of me that feels like they're not going to do that. And if so, then this will be a big problem because then it will be a completely wasted emotional trauma to the audience. Next on to number four, the dark side cave. So much like in a way of mirroring episode uh, five, this movie kind of has Ray, you know, kind of going into a dark side cave. The problem here is that it does absolutely nothing. There's nothing that comes out of this movie. Um, you know, she's, she goes in there kind of searching for answers for her parents, and it teases her with, like, a shadow coming forward, and, and then it's just her own face, so it tells her nothing. And she's like, I thought I would find answers here, but I didn't. She wasn't tempted with the dark side. She, she didn't, like, overcome any challenge. There was literally nothing that came of it. And so... Maybe I'm missing something here, I, and I need you guys to tell me: was there some was there some really deep, profound meaning to this scene that really drove the story that I just totally missed? Because it seems like almost it was a complete waste of time. Like if you had taken that whole scene out of the movie, um, then you wouldn't have known. You would have, the movie would have just been shorter. Maybe I, you know, if if you go see this movie again, that would be a perfect time to go to the bathroom. If because you know, pro, every time I've gone to see this movie, I've had to go to the bathroom because it's just so long. I, I always get a big drink when I go to a movie theater too. So is that what is? Was this scene just meant to be a bathroom break, or or was it something really really important? Because at first I was like, oh yeah yeah, this is kind of talking about her parents and her temptation, but. You know, after the second time, you know, and, and, and thinking about it more, I'm like, there's really nothing that came out of this scene. Really nothing at all. And, and again, maybe it's something that I just missed, or maybe there was some footage that got cut that was going to give it more me- impact. But I just, I don't see any point to this scene. And number five, the entire chase with the First Order kind of following the Rebel fleet. Um, and this is kind of a two-parter. So 
a lot of people have asked in my hyperspace as a weapon video, um, where I did defend some parts of this scene, that why didn't the First Order just jump a Star Destroyer or two just ahead of the Rebel fleet? I've said in, you know, in, in replies, like, well, maybe they can't do micro jumps like that, like the Picard maneuver if you watch Star Trek. Maybe they don't have the ability to make a really short, you know, like a 10,000 meter jump or something like that. Maybe they have to go a certain minimum distance when they go into hyperspace and it would be put them out of range. But if that's true, then why couldn't they just do two jumps, right? Uh, there's a lot of things they could have done. Now, obviously, the answer is, well, that would have, you know, killed the story. And, you know, and I'm, not, I'm no fool here. I understand that movies have to, you know, progress a storyline and you can't just be like, well, why didn't they just kill the bad guy in the first act? And poof, well, then there's no movie. All right, so I know, yes, you got to have the movie. you got to progress the story along a, lot, a line enough to get everything else done. But but it would have been nice if they weren't going to do that, if they'd at least made a mention to it. Um, and, you know, and, and the other thing is, why didn't the, the squadrons um, have to get pulled back? Why did they have to pull the squadrons back, uh, you know, the, the TIE fighters? Why couldn't the fighters have stayed out there? Uh, at least on this one, they mentioned it, but it was unclear. And I'm glad they at least talked about it. They said, we can't support you at that distance. Well, what does that even mean? Um, I don't necessarily need to be spoon-fed why. I'm glad they at least addressed it, uh, but they, which they didn't in the other thing. But I, I, I don't feel it was a good enough addressing. So the inner gamer in me wants to know why. Because in, in tabletop games, squadrons can go out pretty far. They're a little bit less effective because they don't have covering fire. But they can still do it, you know. Um, they can still do it. Like, I mean, the, in episode four, you see a TIE fighter that's pretty darn far away from the Death Star, uh, and it's out on its own. It doesn't have hyperdrive, but it's still flying around. You know, it's, I, I don't understand what they get from being very, very close to their fleet. And unless it's just like radio communication, uh, or some covering fire, but, um, uh, yeah, I didn't see much reason why they couldn't. And they had so many ships there. You know they had at least a 1,000 TIE fighters kind of on standby. So I don't see why they, they couldn't launch them. Um, but back to the whole jumping things ahead, it really would have been nice if they would have had like some lieutenant say to Hux, Sir, should we signal the absolution to prepare for a jump ahead? And then Hux goes, No, let's drag out this torture. You know, or something like that. At least to say that, yes, the option was available, but Hux deliberately wanted to do it. Because I think... Hux is a big part of a lot of these things that people think are plot holes. Hux is just an overconfident fool. And I think that's just part of who his character is. Dude is just dumb. I mean, it, to, to put it plainly, uh, he was put in a position, he didn't earn that rank. He was the child of General Brendel Hux. And so Armitage Hux, who's the General Hux we know now, uh, kind of just got put in there by birth rather than earning it. And so he's he is very foolish. He's somebody who's going to make a lot of mistakes, and that's going to be one of the downfalls of the First Order, I think, in, in Episode Nine. is that he's just... And I hopefully keep going with that, that he's just a spoiled brat kid who doesn't have much experience and makes a lot of mistakes. And that would have been a fine justification here. But they didn't even address the option that they have hyperspace in that scene. Maybe again, maybe it was in the cutting room floor, maybe it was something that got cut for time, uh, and, and then I'm okay with that, but as of right now, I just I can't defend why they didn't do that. I can't come up with a good reason uh, based on the movie the way it is. I can only really speculate. So these were five problems I had with The Last Jedi. Again, I still love the movie. I think it's a great movie. I think if you put these things, these little things that irk you, if you put them aside and just let yourself kind of get taken to where the movie wants to take you, try to let the movie speak to you, you're going to have a great time because I mean it's sad it's emotional but it's also really happy and try you know well triumphant I was about to say but it's not really triumphant I think episode nine is going to be triumphant but there's a lot of highs and lows in this movie I did love it but there are some things that I just you know have no way of describing or defending so that's it guys thank you so much for watching uh do me a favor if you like this video go ahead and give it a thumbs up leave me a comment let me know what you think uh about my list uh, were there any things that you just didn't think couldn't be uh, couldn't be explained or couldn't be defended, even if you really wanted to? Um, and, and I think that's one of the great things about these movies is they get us talking to each other and they get us really trying to get in into these deep conversations with each other, talking about hyperdrives and technology and lightsabers and you know why did Luke's lightsaber have that big explosion when they ripped it apart? And we can theorize and speculate and. It's a lot of fun. I mean, the journey here is 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 the fun of it. Not necessarily the answers, because we didn't get that many answers. But uh, 
But yeah, guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe and click the bell for alerts. There's still a giveaway going on right now. I'll probably be announcing that in the next couple of days. Who wins? The only thing you need to do is to be a subscriber. Leave a comment on this or one of my other videos. And thank you guys so much for watching.